some words from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. For the same God who said, out of darkness let light shine, has caused his light to shine within us, to give the light of revelation, the revelation of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This Sunday, we're going to think about the transfiguration of Jesus. Perhaps like me, you find this one of the more difficult parts of the gospel story, a rather spooky experience and one that it's awkward for us to understand or make relevant. I want to try and suggest though that the transfiguration is an experience which we can all share. When John Lampard was Connectional Local Preachers Secretary, I went to a session where he talked about using story in preaching. And as an example, he gave the following story. He told it much better than I'm about to, but I'll do my best. Helen stood at the bottom of the stairs and shouted up, Are you up yet? We need to go. Her daughter, Jenny, lived and worked away from home but she was back for the weekend. A few minutes later, she came downstairs, dressed in some scruffy jeans, a T-shirt which had on it the dates of the tour of her favourite band, and she was wearing a pair of dirty trainers. They rushed out of the shop, onto the bus and to the shop, the wedding dress shop. Jenny was home for a fitting for her forthcoming wedding. She disappeared with the assistant into the changing area and after about half an hour she came out, transformed. All in white, graceful, shiny. Helen said, you look absolutely beautiful. Twenty minutes later they were back on the bus, Jenny again in t-shirt and jeans. She turned to her mother and said, you won't tell them, will you, what it's like? You will keep it secret. We think about the transfiguration, that transient experience when the disciples saw Jesus differently. It was an experience where they went away from their normal life, up a mountain, and for a few minutes were granted sight of something totally different. As they came down from the mountain, they're commanded to keep it secret for the time being. We can imagine that mother's feelings at the sudden and transient change in the appearance of her daughter. But Peter, James and John's experience is more difficult for us to share and comprehend. But what I want to concentrate on for a few moments is the very transient nature of that experience. In the Gospel story, it follows on from the part where Jesus discusses with his disciples who he is and ends with him explaining how he will suffer with Peter objecting to it. And finally, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Peter just does not understand. Jesus then takes them up a mountain and for a few minutes he sees Jesus transfigured and hears him called the beloved Son of God. When they come down, they encounter the failed attempt of the remaining disciples to treat a boy for epilepsy. And then we hear that they're arguing amongst themselves about who is the greatest. Jesus is again struggling to enable his followers to understand what is important, what his kingdom is. The Transfiguration is a glimpse of glory given to three disciples amidst all the questions and uncertainties that they shared for several years. It stands out as a short moment of insight amidst lots of confusion. I wonder if you're familiar with the saying that goes like this. The past is history, the future is a mystery, but this moment is a gift from God, which is why we call it the present. The present moment is important if we too are going to be able to glimpse the glory of God in the face of Jesus. 
R.S. Thomas was a 20th century Welsh poet and an Anglican priest, and this is one of his poems. I have seen the sun break through to illuminate a small field for a while and gone my way and forgotten it. But that was the pearl of great price, the one field that had treasure in it. I realise now that I must give all that I have to possess it. Life is not hurrying on to a receding future, nor hankering after an imagined past. It is the turning aside, like Moses, to the miracle of the lit bush, to a brightness that seems as transitory as your youth once, but is the eternity that awaits you. Thomas's poem talks about a moment when we catch a glimpse of something beautiful and inspiring, the way the light from the sun suddenly breaks through some clouds to light up a field. Just a moment and it's gone. Thomas says it is lost, that he's not valued it. But of course, ironically, in this instance, he has and captured it in a way forever in a poem. Life is not hurrying on to a receding future not hankering after an imagined past. As we aspire to things in the future, they're often still in the future and we chase but do not catch up with them. Likewise, we tend to remember the past as we would like to think it was, rather than how it really was, an imagined past. Life is not hurrying on to a receding future nor hankering after an unimagined past. It is the turning aside like Moses to the miracle of the lit bush, to a brightness that seemed as transitory as your youth once, but is the eternity that awaits you. Moses suddenly is aware of a bush, perhaps a bush he's seen many times before, a blaze and yet not being consumed, not going, not changing. And in that moment, he is aware that he is in the presence of God, that he can hear God talking to him. The moment out of time, which is the present, that gift from God. I hope you're familiar with C.S. Lewis's brilliant insight into the Christian faith that comes from the screw tape letters imagined letters from a senior devil to a junior inexperienced one. By stating what harms and diminishes Christian faith, turning everything upside down, his humorous letters help us to understand what is important. In one passage, the senior devil writes about time. And of course, for the devil, the enemy is God. Humans live in time but our enemy destines them to eternity. He therefore, I believe, wants them to attend chiefly to two things, to eternity itself and to that point in time which they call the present. For the present is the point at which time touches eternity. Screwtape goes on to say that it is there, the devil's business, to get humans away from the present, sometimes by encouraging people to dwell in the past, but what is better from their point of view is to live in the future. Nearly all vices are rooted in the future. Gratitude looks in the past, love to the present, but fear, avarice, lust and ambition to the future. Of course, the past is important. We learn from the past. It is our experience, our understanding of how things are and where we've got to. Memory is the most precious of gifts, so obviously emphasised when it is lost. Similarly, we must prepare for the future. We have to organise our lives, our resources, our time to make the most of what lies ahead. But when C.S. Lewis says the present is the point at which time touches eternity, He's reminding us that if we too want to experience God in some way that transcends our normal experience, then it has to be in the present moment. 
we need to free ourselves from the clutter of our concerns and anxieties for the future and the assumptions and prejudices we've gained from the past. Paul, writing to his friends in Corinth, speaks of people whose minds are so blinded or occupied with the things that they think are important, the God of this passing age, that they cannot see the glory of God revealed in Christ. A simple way of saying it is, I suppose, if you've things on your mind, then you're not going to be able to appreciate the moments when God reveals himself to you. Right now, it's natural to think quite appropriately of how much better life was before the pandemic and to be concerned about how things will evolve, hoping that better times are soon here. If, like me, you find much less to occupy your time, you may feel that we are just living in the present. But there's more to it than that. We need to grasp those moments when we glimpse eternity. As R.S. Thomas describes in his poem, we need to turn aside to see the burning bush and know the presence of God. We need to recognise those moments and open ourselves up to them. Paul's words come as part of a convoluted and complicated passage taking images of Moses wearing a veil because God's glory revealed to him was too much for the people to see. But Paul is confident that in Jesus all may see the glory of God. God who created light to conquer darkness has caused his light to shine within us to give the light of revelation the revelation of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He has caused his light to shine within us to give the light of revelation, the revelation of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The transfiguration should be an experience which illuminates not just the lives of a few disciples, but us too, and through us, others.